Um, <clears throat> hi. <laughs> you might wonder why I'm so hesitant on this episode. Well, how many of you guys are Star Trek fans? I have a weird feeling it's a decent chunk of you. I have been talking about Star Trek with Star Trek fans since the 80s, basically. Uh, originally just, you know, friends, kids at school, uh, family members, and then we started going to the conventions, me and mom started going to conventions, me and dad started going to conventions, you know. I, and then, you know, the internet opened up, uh, news groups, email chains, all that fun stuff. The internet as a whole, forum started being a thing. And of course, as I kept growing older, I would still interact with people in person, you know, co-workers or friends or just people on the, uh, well, on the street and more like, like in the grocery store or whatever. Uh, or like at Gen Con, for example. Again, the convention scene. A slightly different convention, but still, you can still talk about Star Trek at a Gen Con, right? So, of all these years, across all these years, there have been many debates that I've engaged in uh, when it comes to Star Trek. Most of those are large-scale debates, the ones that are repeating. You know, who's your favorite captain is one of the more traditional ones, right? Or, or how about... Um, you know, how, how well do you think this ship would work in a, in a fight against this other ship? Or do you think, who do you think would win in a war between the Romulans, the Klingons, the Federation? Just fairly normal, large-scale questions like that. Or, or just simple things like, who's your favorite engineer? Who's your favorite doctor? Who's your favorite you know, science person, etc.? But there's one thing that's a weird exception that I've heard debated since this episode came out. This would have been 91, 92? We're on the 91-92 changeover here. Is it, okay, so it's been 92, February of 92. I've heard debated. And that is, basically, how much do you buy into the premise of this episode? That's what it really boils down to. So before I go anywhere further, where are you at on that particular battle? And I've heard this get into the point of actually being argumentative battling before. A lot of arguing about this point. Now, I'm going to go ahead and give my opinion and I firmly believe in that opinion, especially having rewatched this episode, uh, I call bull, basically. If you, can't, if you don't understand what I mean, let me explain very briefly. Uh, Macduff is part of the blah, blah, blah people, and they show up and they're like, hey, uh, yeah, we have the ability to perfectly erase the memories of everyone on the ship, which includes multiple different alien species, as well as Data, the super advanced android, of which there's only one. Well, you know what I mean. And the ship's computer to very, very, very specifically erase memories and records just to set up this circumstance. I, that is incredibly advanced technology. They also happen to be people who are ridiculously unadvanced in terms of weapons development, despite having been at war for the better part of several decades. Uh, this is also worth noting that they've been at war with these other people who are also not particularly advanced, as we demonstrate in this episode. Now, that's, that's the premise right there. The usual argument goes something like this. Well, they've decided for whatever reason their species has hyper-specialized into one avenue of development. So they are literally crap at science and shields and weapons and all that. But they're really good at, you know, the brain thing. I myself have defended this episode on that point. This is one of the reasons why this is actually kind of surprising to me that I have basically shifted sides having rewatched the episode. Because the thing is, them being really, really good at memory alteration and nothing else makes a degree of sense. I myself have pointed out many times that science is not a universal thing. Like, you're not just universally more advanced. You, you, there's multiple dozens, hundreds of fields of science and advancement and technological progression. So it's not like you can just say, I'm tech level 15. No, it's I have this you know, advancement for shields and this advancement for faster than light drive and this advancement for uh, construction of resources, or excuse me, a development of resources, this one for refinement of resources, this one for construction, this one for medical tech, this one for scanning tech, this one for medical scanning tech, et cetera, et cetera. There's, there's tons of different fields is my point. And that was always my argument. Now, I, I, I never really held onto that strong because my ultimate argument was always, yeah, no, it's kind of dumb, but I'm willing to accept it because I like the episode. And that was always my final line on the matter. And I was usually able to, to have some kind of consensus with most people I was debating it on because most people I like, even, or most people I like, most people I debate this with, even the ones who, who found that to be, huh, agreed with me that this was an enjoyable episode. 
But the thing is, it's not just the fact that they're super advanced when it comes to memories, which would be the specific thing. I mean, we actually encountered a race that had a big memory thing just a few episodes ago in Violations, right? And keep that in mind, by the way. I'm going to be bringing up Violations again in a second. But in addendum to that, they had to have been really, really good at memories across multiple races, which is, okay, so it's suspension of disbelief, right? Really good at memory racing. Yeah, okay. Really good at memory racing across all races equally. Uh, really good at memory racing of the computer and somehow bypassing all security whatsoever and just perfectly erasing the exact records they need to within seconds, no less. Uh, doing it for data on top of all that? And there goes my suspension of disbelief. It's gone. I can't. I can't. I can't buy into it. This is the perfect example of the cloud effect. I'm, I'm half tempted to rename this the conundrum effect. For those of you who don't look at my loriums, the cloud effect is a stupid premise that gives us a good whatever. You know, it's like, all right, I'm willing to accept that Darth Maul lived. Spoilers. Because the episodes that actually had Darth Maul were really good. That, that's the cloud effect right there. Now, this episode was basically written by Joe Minoski, and boy, God, does it show. Because it's actually a really fascinating premise with an engaging uh, concept, and I, I love what they do with the characters, and it makes no sense. <laughs> like, no sense at all, right? As I just described. Again, whether you agree with it or not, I, I am looking forward to hearing you guys and, and seeing the debate continue. It's just, just, just also stay civil, that's all I ask. I've, like I said, I've heard this one get pretty... Knock down, drag out. But regardless, I, I don't think I ever really realized this before, but this is the prototype, the beta version, if you will, of Workforce, part one and two. Now, for those of you who don't remember, Workforce, part one and two, are, is a two-part over in Voyager, which I actually really like. It's among my favorite episodes in Voyager. I've discussed why over in those ruminations. I'm not going to repeat myself here until I finally redo the Voyager ruminations, which I really want to do someday. But regardless... <laughs> Regardless, it's the same general premise, because it's a very specific thing, see? You have to remove the... You have to remove the circumstances of position and current knowledge without removing the circumstances of past knowledge and personality. In other words, the whole thing that made Workforce work was that that was Janeway. It wasn't Janeway mind-controlled. It wasn't Janeway reprogrammed. It wasn't Janeway, well, under an influence. We've seen dozens, probably more. I don't, probably not. We've seen dozens of episodes across all of Star Trek of being influenced by an external force. That, that's such a common thing that it's aggravating. It's why I keep pointing it out, how people never notice it, right? That's a very common trend. But to actually be yourself, but minus one piece, or with context altered... That's far more engaging for me. I can only think of three episodes off the top of my head that have done that. This one, Workforce Part 1 and 2, which I'm counting as one, and uh, The Killing Game, which actually uh, tried to do the exact same thing uh, to varying degrees of success. <laughs> I love that concept because what it does then is it approaches it from a very science fiction angle. What if? What if the crew of the Enterprise was all still them? That's still Riker, that's still Roe, that's still Picard, etc. But the specifics of their position have been shifted. And now they're not really sure what to do about it. It's a fascinating premise, and it's a great way to examine characters. Notice, so okay, I mentioned violations earlier. Violations in this episode have the same mystery construct, which I've re referenced before. Uh, some people tell me it's the Hitchcock thing. I, I don't know if I actually know if that's a proper term or not. But the idea is we know what the characters don't. And that then forms the nature of the tension. You know, don't go down that hole. Don't open that door. Because we know what the characters don't, right? Now, that's the base level of it, but it can, it's, it can be an excellent storytelling tool if utilized properly. Now, in Violations, the problem is they didn't do anything with it. They gave it away way too early, which can work, but they didn't do anything with it after. Then it was just, all right, repeating the, the notes. By contrast, here, they give it away very early. In the teaser, actually. The teaser's excellent. There's a ship, all right, raise shields, whatever. Uh, there's actually, I'm sorry, the teaser establishes several things. So let, let's do this in order. I'm sorry, I'll come back to the analogy about violations in a second. Troy beats data at chess, which I don't buy for a millisecond, although I do have a headcanon answer for that. Now, finally, I finally come up with a headcanon answer. You remember how Alexander was able to beat the program on the holodeck back in Newground? 
I postulated the idea of the holodeck having a casual difficulty setting for kids or for people who are just getting into it or don't want a difficulty. So why not data having a casual... Data, set your difficulty in chess to casual, please. Thank you. Do, 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 do. You think I'm joking, but it's the only thing I've ever come up with that makes sense. I'm sorry, chess is not an intuitive game. Not even three-dimensional chess. <laughs> Anyways, so then we see Riker and Roe. Now, that's actually a good bit. It shows that the two are still butting heads, but they're a little bit more reasonable about it. And you can see how there is the dynamic of connection between the two. I don't mean the romantic connection. I mean the fact that the two are basically on the same board. Riker likes to be exceptional and, in fact, tends to encourage people to do their best. As he himself says, if Roe had come to him, he probably would have said yes. He's pissed that she didn't come to him. You know what I mean. He is pissed that she didn't actually approach him and say, hey, can I do this new procedure? And I'm with him on that, actually. She's pissed because she thinks she's being molded into some kind of specific type of officer, which actually isn't quite true. But again, because she's so used to that, especially from Starfleet, you can see why she's bouncing back off of him. In other words, it is circumstance and context which is making them bounce off of each other, even though, realistically, the two should actually get along. And we do see uh, shades of that in this episode. Then... Uh, then the scan happens, and everyone just kind of goes, whoa, and everyone's weirded out for a bit. And what I love about it is it takes quite a while for them to say, the, uh, to say what's actually going through their head. That's good. That's good writing. Because, for example, if you right now were just men in black, right? You know, psh, hang on, hang on. Let me make sure that uh, we do this proper lack. Psh, there we go. And, and you're, just, you're suddenly unaware of who you are and where you are. Your first thought isn't going to be to say out loud, who am I? I don't remember anything. That is very unnatural dialogue. That's not what we would say in real life. By contrast, everyone just kind of being like, who? Huh? And just like several solid seconds of legitimate confusion until finally it is Riker who says to Picard, I'm not sure who any of you are. And then Picard, who hesitantly then rejoinders, yes, I'm not, I'm not even sure who I am. You know, it, it feels much more natural that way. Minoski is pretty good at dialogue, so that doesn't surprise me. And then, and this is what really sells the teaser, the camera pans a little bit and we see someone new. Some guy we've never seen before. Brand new actor, uh, you know, Macduff, just standing there in his uniform, looking around, looking confused, just like everyone else. And that's the Hitchcock thing. We now know, huh. And that also is another way this episode succeeds in a way that violations didn't. Because throughout the course of this episode, the characters slowly unfold the mystery of who they are not with, with regards to the specifics of the individual, the, the specifics of the role within the ship, the ship itself, and the Federation as a whole. And we are given the treat of basically finding out as they find out. Not, and, and I know what you're saying. Well, that's just repeated exposition. We know who Troy is. Yes, but when they, get, they go out of the way to give us correct information so that the incorrect information is thus more properly... Uh, the contrast is there better. So that we can... It, it's like if you had a puzzle and there's just three or four pieces are just wrong, you know? And each one stands out like, that doesn't fit there at all. And thus we can... Thus we, the audience, can slowly piece together what's really going on well before the characters do. And thus we have a mystery to solve in addition to the characters having a mystery to solve, even though we have already solved their mystery. Make sense? The construction is much better, is what I'm trying to say, than violations. Now, there's a nice bit where uh, tr uh, Ro just pretty much turns around and just starts checking the thing without thinking about it. And then Picard says, we seem to still have our, our skill sets. What I love best about this intro bit, before they find their own records, is that we get some good characterization. This is, again, a way that violations fail. I, I hate to keep paralleling it, but there's so many direct parallels between the nature of the construction of these two episodes that I feel, the, feel compelled to, especially since I just covered violations you know, just a couple weeks ago, however long it's been. So what we see is Roe is certainly very aggressive, but not in, a, not in a I'm going to hurt you way, more of a I want to do something way. I don't like feeling powerless. I don't like feeling helpless. I want to go do something. You know, the Ivanova thing, right? Then, and, and so we see in Picard, right off the bat, even as he's saying, we all seem to still have our same skill sets, he is naturally and logically deducing his way through the situation. They never even call attention to that, by the way. 
the, you know, Jordy just kind of knows how to use the tech. Crusher just kind of knows how to use the medical stuff. Roe knows how to use the panel. Picard knows how to be a frickin' leader. And they never say that. He just naturally slides into the role effortlessly and manages to also be an accomplished diplomat at basically every step of the way. He is the one who encourages them to work together, to communicate with each other, to coordinate properly, and to offer not only ideas for how they could do things alternatively, but also to, to basically you know, be willing to give up and say, okay, we'll go ahead and get military done first, and once that's done, we should try this. He is an accomplished diplomat at every step of the way. Riker, by the way, because we get a little bit of him too, is fully the people person. Now, that's not to say Riker's perfect in this episode, because there's actually a scene that, that just drives me nuts that it's in this episode, but Riker, nevertheless, at every step of the way, is the person who's trying to be affable and friendly, the fatherly figure, which is something that is basically his overall approach to command. This is something he'll eventually butt heads with Jericho on in season six, I want to say, is when that happens. Anywho. So, Worf... This is a good one, because Worf automatically, automatically takes charge, but not in an arrogant way. It's a brilliant little bit of characterization in its own right, because Worf naturally assumes command, even if he has no leadership qualities. In other words, Worf effectively becomes the first officer slash military commander of the ship, whereas Picard effectively becomes the captain and actual leader of the crew if you understand my distinction. And both slide into that role naturally. It's no wonder that later on the writers would decide to put Worf in the red shirt because, I mean, honestly, it makes perfect sense. I've said for many years, uh, by the time they finally did that, that he was command material, and I stand by that statement. So, anywho, um, I'm looking at my notes here. Data is a bartender. I don't have anything to say to that. But I actually do. I do have one thing to say about that because that's another thing I find fascinating about the premise. You have a flash and everything freezes and when it unfreezes, wherever you are at that exact moment, that's all you have to deduce who and what you are. Now later they get, you know, records on their names and their positions, but this early part when everyone just is kind of where they are and trying to assume what they are based on that, that's actually fascinating to me. It's so fascinating. I've wanted to make it. This is not a joke. And I shouldn't even be telling you this. But I've wanted to make a video game based on that premise for forever. Like, that's, that's just a wonderful concept. I've actually tried. I've never actually got a game going, unfortunately. But I've tried to GM, uh, you know, a D&D type thing. A pen and paper game of the similar concept. So what, and I do, and I'm like, all right, make your characters, but no personality whatsoever. And they're like, okay. And then sit them down. And it's like, here's where you are. Obviously, that would take a lot of work because I'd have to engineer basically the whole story, whole cloth, select the point they're at, select where they're at, tell them where they're at because I need to know all the answers, right? So it, it would be very difficult to pull off, but I think that would be just a wonderful concept as it is here. Data was behind the bar making this drink for her, so it is only logical to assume that this is his function. Troy was down here. She doesn't have anything going on other than the fact that she has the badge but a different uniform, so she is obviously distinct from the rest. She also mentions her empathy. I, I have to point out that her ability to sense is actually only mentioned once in this episode and never used in any way, shape, or form against Macduff. She never senses a damn thing from him. So I'm going to go ahead and chalk this up to, yes, once again, Troy should have just not had her powers because she functionally doesn't. She references them once, and everything else is just her remembering her imzadi. The lady who was in... I'm sorry, one moment, please. The lady who was in uh, sickbay in her bathing suit who had just come in from the holodeck, you know? That's another example of someone who just in that moment, who am I, right? How do you do, what do you use to deduce that in that moment? Okay, who the heck am I? Well, I like swimming... And that's all I got. You know, it's, it's a fascinating premise, like I said. I almost wish it took longer for them to figure out who each other was. Because the other funny thing is, you notice nobody uses any names until they get the reports. How could they? They don't know their names. That's also a, an interesting little bit. You know, at some point, would you have to just invent names for each other, right? Or how, how would you? Would you just select a name yourself? What would you use to select it? Is, there's a bunch of interesting what-ifs there that I, I really feel that could be explored in even more depth. It's just fascinating stuff. Now, uh, 
I'm looking at my notes here. Let's continue the Troy thing really quick here. So, Riker and Roe get super flirty. That actually makes sense to me. As I've said before, the two characters kind of gravitate towards each other. And if you take away the, the history, you know, the, the context, as I mentioned earlier, and just make it so the two characters are suddenly there, I think they would be friends. Then you add the fact that he is Riker, and I, I don't like this about his character, but it is a true fact of his character that he is a horn dog. He is a very flirtatious person. And then we add Ro, who is someone who, you know, is feeling vulnerable and hurt, and he is going through a specific trauma. And what I'm trying to say is that in such a mo- in a moment of emotional duress, I like to think that multiple people tried to romantically hook up in this. It is actually, it's not the kind of thing I would do because I just don't think that way. But it's an extremely understandable and there's nothing to be ashamed of kind of response. In dire, horrible situations, people tend to seek some kind of comfort, and physical intimacy with someone else is a very significant source of phys- of comfort. This just sounds like a duh, so please forgive me if I'm sounding so obvious here. What I'm trying to say is that, if anything, I imagine multiple people are like, oh God, what's going on? I don't know who I am. What, I am. what should I do? And there's someone there who happens to be of whatever gender they like and are liked in return. And they're like, hey... You know, I can see those kind of hookups happening. What I like to think in the back of my mind is that some of them stuck. Obviously not Roe and Riker, just, you know. So Riker and Roe do get together. Okay, sure. I'm with that. Troy is what I really want to bring up because she feels like there's something else there. It's not the se- it's empathy thing. She's not sensing him. She's not being like, what do I feel from you? It's just some kind of trickle in the back of her mind that's just a little bit beyond the normal memories. I like that. That makes sense because they're supposed to be super connected in some big, grandiose way that bypasses normal connections, right? Imzadi, right? I just said right three times in a row. I apologize. I'm really nauseous all of a sudden. That's why I had to pause and take a drink. I don't know what's going on with that. So, to me, that doesn't need her empathy. That was was the whole point. She doesn't need her scanning powers in order to be able to sense her Imzadi, I don't think. And I actually kind of thought that was pretty cool. In fact, if you're paying attention, and this is the other time I'm going to mention violations. Last time, I swear, and then I'll be done with that stupid episode. You notice in that episode, she and Riker were pretty cool. Like, there was a lot of coolness there. I made my points about that when I was talking about that last, or however many weeks ago it was now. This is sort of a continuation of that. And if you notice, season five and a little bit of six will kind of be pushing Riker and Troy together a bit more. Now, this is very strange, because the two of them had a built-in connection all the way back in season one, and they both have basically discussed on and off since then how much, you know, he's got his career, she's got her career, and they've decided to break it off and remain very close friends. And there's been some off and on between them, but then they're kind of drifting back closer towards each other. Riker almost kisses her in this episode, to, to wit, and, well, you know, how Nemesis ends up. I just... I, I, I wonder if that was being done because romance sells or because there was some kind of actual direction. Because as we know, that gets completely interrupted by many things between now and Nemesis. So, including the Roe thing. But that brings me to my point. Riker and Roe hooking up. Okay, I already explained that. That makes perfect sense. In the middle, keep in mind, at this point, Riker 2, the Riker with this set of memories, is currently in a romantic entanglement with Roe. Probably a physical one, given the whole you're not going to get any sleep sort of a thing. So, okay, they're having sex. Fine, we can say that we're all adults here. Here's my question. If Riker is that, why is he then okay with kissing Troy? Now, I know that people are going to say polygamy, but uh, honestly, I don't think Riker is capable of making a decision like that in this circumstance. Rather, I think this is just more of him being... A horn dog, and that's what I don't like about it. Because that is it. Let's just be honest. That is the answer. He really feels connected to Troy, and he happens to really like having sex with Ro. So he tries to have both, and then it blows up in his face. That's even the coda of the episode. They never even address this ever again, dude. That's the other part. So I don't even know what to make of this at this point. One thing I do want to say, though, and I actually like this, they keep all their memories after this incident, so it's not like their memories are reset back to when they lost them. That's got to really change a lot of people's interactions and dynamics with each other, don't you think? Especially Riker and Roe. Anyways, <clears throat> moving on. Worf, 
when he finds out he is not in charge and is in fact just the tactical person, he is visibly upset by this. But what I like best about that is the first thing he does is he apologizes to Picard, and Picard immediately says, no problem. Because that's Worf, and because that's Picard. Again, they are still themselves, regardless of the lack of, of memory and the connections. Remember, Picard and Worf have a lot of history together. There's a reason Picard is like the go-to Klingon guy among Starfleet right now. And it's pretty much entirely because of Worf and his interactions with him and the Klingons as a consequence of him. So in other words, that makes perfect sense. And I just like the fact that he, they're still each other, despite lacking all of that history. Now... I'm looking to my notes here. I've already talked about that. I already talked about that. Um, Picard is, of course, very investigative. He just has to figure out what's going on. It, it's clues. It's a mystery. Why was this man shot? Where was the money he was talking about? You know, that is Picard at every step in this episode. He is constantly trying to piece things together. It's actually funny because if McDuff had tried this on just a random old ship, which wasn't a Galaxy-class cruiser with these people at its head, he might have actually succeeded at this plan. <laughs> um, but I point this up because at every step, Picard is investigating and McDuff is both passively and aggressively interfering with that. The two most obvious examples of that being him and his basically going up to the thing and saying, we're ready to fire on them. And they're like, oh, they're, they're opening frequencies. Oh, okay, open. Because, of course, Picard would automatically say, oh, they want to talk, sure. It is McDuff who has to jump in and say, no, that could be how they use their weapon. And he has a valid point. The funny thing is, I think he would have lost that argument right then and there, if not for the fact that the enemy ship then opened fire on the Enterprise. I, <laughs> I'm not saying that was the wrong decision for them to make. A giant cruiser of death just showed up on their border and is refusing to communicate with them. But at the same time, a giant cruiser of deaths just showed up. Maybe opening fire like after you know maybe 20 seconds of trying to communicate isn't the best decision. It's really convenient is what I'm trying to say. Just like a lot of this episode because Joe Minoski. So anywho, so Data has actually a pretty cool scene with Geordi. It's a scene that could have fit in any other episode, but it fits better here because it's basically Data, without his memories, speculating on his own existence. Maybe it's data and Jordy, I should say. Both, you know, maybe there is only one data. Maybe it's so difficult to make one, that's why each ship only gets one. Maybe there's a whole bunch of datas out there, and I just happen to be the only one on this ship. It's just some good spitballing and some good theory crafting. Uh, I don't have anything to add to it, really. It's just a nice little scene. Um, so then McDuff volunteers for the surgery. It's like, okay, I'll get this done. We'll figure this out. Okay, no problem. Oh, God, I'm dying. Oh, jeez, please. Oh, oh, I thought you were going to kill me there. Thank goodness. Whew. We better not try that again, huh? Yeah. Can we go and blow up that command center now, please? Because the problem with the episode is all of the... The problem with the episode is everything. Like I said, the construction of it had issues. This is why I think Workforce did a better job of this. But the enemy, the Lycians, are overwhelmingly inferior in every way to the Enterprise. The Enterprise just, okay, oh my god, they got 50 probes, all right, go! Okay, they're all dead. Uh, what? I'm sorry, I blinked and missed the battle. You know, it, they, this is not just a tactical advantage. This is not just like a galaxy class going up against a Burrell bird. This is a galaxy class going up against the real-life Challenger shuttle. There is no contest here. <laughs> they just roll over them effortlessly. And then when they get to the giant command center, and the first thing he does is tactical analysis, and they, they give it to us. And it's actually hard data for once. You know, it's like 10 lasers and like 40 torpedoes, and that's it. And Picard's just like, What? And it is Troy who brings up, how many people are on there? Oh, a whole bunch. And then they're like, okay, okay, hold on. Right before this, there's a scene where Macduff tries to ensure Worf's loyalty. We are the warriors on this ship. That is why we are on this ship, because we are the ones fit for battle. And so he tries to ensure Worf's loyalty, because he suspects Picard will waffle at the end, in order to ensure that he completes his mission. What I like best about that is for all of his specifics and all of his information, he has no idea who Worf is as a person. Picard actually says it best, and I quote, I do not fire on defenseless people. So Macduff insists on going and doing it anyways, and Worf says, no. 
because Worf is also not someone who will fire on a defensive person. Worf is a warrior, but he means that as a source of well, honor, as a veneration. He is someone who will fight a worthy opponent and will die in the effort. But if you give him a, a sword and say, go start slaughtering, he will say, no. Once again, characterization. Um, so, you know, they, ah, they shoot him, they find out, they fix themselves, woo. And then, of course, Riker has to face Roe and, and Troy. That's something I would want to do if I'm being 100% honest. That would be a very terrifying moment. Regardless, regardless of its plot, fl plot holes, and there are multiples, as I think I pointed out, I did still very much enjoy this episode. This is a good one to end the year on. Uh, on a high mark, so to speak. I know that it's just kind of an artificial thing because then next week we'll just do another one. But nevertheless, I hope you guys have enjoyed my thoughts and I will be seeing you next time.